Hi, this is Dick Morris. Welcome to Deep Six, the Deep State. Um, is the volume okay, Renee? Uh, I'm only hearing you on FaceTime, so. Oh, okay. Wait a minute. I think I have volume off. Turn your volume all the way up. Yeah. I can hear you. I just checked it. We're good. Okay, is the volume all right now? Yeah, it was fine before. You were good. You are good. Good. Okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Deep Six, the Deep State. This is Dick Morris. Um, we're going to be doing something different in the future. Um, for at least the next week or two, I have a pretty heavy schedule of foreign travel um, and some races that I'm doing and also around the U.S. to work for Republicans running for the Senate. So I can't allocate for the next week or two this kind of time every day at 4 o'clock. So I'm going to be doing five minutes deep six broadcasts during the day, uh, probably at least one a day and perhaps two or three. And so share so that you get my notifications. Renee, can you explain how to do that? Well, everyone, you have to go to Dick's Facebook page and click that you're following. And when you sign up for notifications, make sure that you are set for all notifications, including posts and live. Um, now, Dick, people have been reached have reached out to me saying that they've done that and they're still not getting notifications. So, um, if anyone has any problems, please reach me and we'll get you them set up. Okay. The other way to do that, of course, is just anytime you want, go to Deep Six, the Deep State Facebook page, and it, the latest broadcast will be on the top, right, Renee? Yes. Yeah. Yes. We'll put Good. it to the top. Good. Okay, so I hope to stay in touch with you. May not be able to take questions all the time, but we'll do. We'll figure something out. Uh, maybe if you make comments, then I can reference them the next time that I broadcast. The uh, first thing I want to focus on today is the very important perspective that a Parkland parent had about all of the focus on gun control in the aftermath of that horrible shooting in Parkland. And uh, to me, his statement really, really uh, echoed uh, the truth. Um, he was on an interview, in, I think, with uh, Chris Wallace. And Wallace was asking him all about gun control in the aftermath of the shooting. And he said, uh, listen, instead of focusing on the kind of security hardening that would end these shootings immediately, the media are instead politicizing the issue, hoping to capitalize on a tragedy by focusing on the bitterly divisive issue of gun control. So he's saying basically that you're taking this away from something where there is an immediate solution and putting it into a long-term debate over the issue of gun control. And you may have your opinions and your views on that, but for God's sakes, A, don't wait to take school security measures, and B, don't think that when you've debated gun control, you've addressed this issue. He said, my daughter's dead, my kid's going to school in Kentucky on Monday, and what I want to know is how are these kids safe? How about bringing that up in the media? My kid's not going to, not, my kid's not here because the schools aren't safe. You go into a courthouse, the judge is safe. The stenographer is not worried someone's coming in with a gun because they can't get in with a gun. The American people, we just want our schools safe. We don't want to talk about guns right now. What a brilliant, prophetic, wonderful way to look at it. I've been pushing, as you know, for metal detectors in schools, but truthfully, that's only part of an agenda to harden school security. And uh, that really is the generic issue, and it's one that needs to get focus. Now, whenever the House Republicans try to draw attention to that, the media accuses them of distracting from the gun control debate. And uh, it's not distracting, it is the answer. Uh, to the school shootings. Uh, as I pointed out, there are 100,000 school buildings in the United States. It would cost $500 each, 500 million, to put metal detectors in each of them, and a little extra to man them. You'd need to use off-duty cops, retired people, and stuff like that, but uh, or on-duty cops uh, that can be spared from the precinct. And, uh, and that would deal with the problem, along with other measures for school security. In Israel, they rely on school security to stop shootings. Uh, metal detectors, special guards, uh, times when the building's open and times when it's not accessible, and other measures like that to harden those sites 
and God knows they have a serious problem with uh, Arab terrorists who want to use the schools as a killing ground to further their ideology and commit mass murder. So this really is the debate that we need to be having. And the important thing is, as this parent says, to harden the site uh, so that the schools are safe. And when he points out that courtrooms are safe, uh, that's a very good point. The White House is safe. The Capitol is safe. You can't get into the Capitol carrying a gun or anything metallic or the White House. Um, you pass the, the lobbyists and those folks and congressmen have a special badge. But the public has to go into the Capitol through the south entrance, which is manned by a metal detector and two armed security guards. Let's apply the same level of protection to our school children that we do to our congressmen. And uh, that's a, a very basic point. And let's not hijack this whole issue from a discussion of school security and stopping these shootings into a discussion about gun control. Uh, gun control has its own merits and demerits. Let that debate proceed. But don't think you're doing anything about school security by pursuing that debate. Any comments, Renee? Yes, uh, Hector Morales wants to know, what can be done now about Sessions' lack of action in many areas of concern as related to Clinton crimes? Well, Clinton crimes, I think that we need to keep pressure on him. Um, and I'll talk about that a little later in the broadcast. But the thing I want to start with here is the need to harden our schools and make them secure. Um, politically, what's going on is that the Democrats are trying to use this issue essentially to blunt the political impact of the tax cut and to make the issue no longer uh, economics but school security and use gun control to do that. And they, they were, it's succeeding. Um, the most recent poll about generic congressional vote showed an uptick for the Democrats after showing a long decline and a move toward the Republicans. And uh, we can't let this debate be hijacked, not just politically, but also because of the, the importance of the issue that's involved. Now, Trump just announced his re-election bid <laughs> uh, three years in advance, which is, I guess, pretty good. Uh, people had speculated that he might want to run only one term. And even if he does, that should be a last-minute tweet. Once you announce you're not running again, you lose a large percentage of your power, maybe a third of it, because you won't be around. And uh, you won't be there to reward and to punish adversaries and supporters. So uh, the argument for a one-term, six-year presidency with no re-election is, I think, always bogus because the president would be powerless. Uh, he would lack the capacity uh, to use the presidency effectively to govern. But what I thought was really interesting is that he selected Brad Pascal. Am I pronouncing that right? P-A-S-C-A-L-E. Brad Pascali or Pascal. Depends on whether you're Italian or American. We'll go with Pascal unless somebody corrects me. I like it. <laughs> okay. Uh, he said, I understood early in 16 that Facebook was how Donald Trump was going to win. Uh, he said in a 60 Minutes interview in October of 17, Twitter is how he talked to people, Facebook was how he won. And that point is so fundamental. It's why I do these broadcasts. In 1999, my wife and I wrote a book called Vote.com, which was keyed to a website we had back then in the very early days of the internet where people could log on and vote on political issues we would post. And they, we also posted things about health issues, transportation, entertainment, what movies did you like. It was a site that was way ahead of itself, of its time. And we had offices in native languages in Japan, uh, in South Korea, in uh, France, and uh, Argentina. And uh, it was doing well. The only problem is we couldn't make any money. <laughs> because nobody had yet figured out how to make money off the internet. Internet advertising was still very much in its infancy. And um, we had pretty good capital investment, but when that ran out, we were, we were stranded. So we ended that. But our book continues, and our book, Vote.com, predicted in 1998 that the internet would take over politics. 
and that television advertising would become a thing of the past and that internet advertising would become the future and that because internet communications, whether advertising or blogs, uh, cost very little, if anything, uh, money would lose its dominant role in our politics, uh, both because people could raise money online and because the online communications would replace the need to spend money on television. And uh, that prediction is right in the process of coming true. And by selecting a digital person for his next campaign, and by spending markedly less than his rivals did in the presidential election and doing much less television advertising, I think Trump heralded that change. And for all the focus on Trump's enlisting new demographic groups, uh, white high school educated men, as his core constituency, we also need to look at the technological change that he brought about, which was enormous. And every day now, he is bypassing the media and structuring their coverage by tweeting, speaking directly to tens of millions of Americans who get his tweet, and by making the tweet his main form of communication, as opposed to press statements, he forces the media, the news media, to cover the tweets, and uh, that becomes what they have to cover. That readjustment in focus from off media to on uh, internet digital communication through social media is absolutely fundamental to changing the fabric of his presidency. Um, in fact, if you look back over history, when FDR first, well, started with Woodrow Wilson, he first used the idea of public speaking as a way of rallying support for his presidency. Uh, the presidents never used to deliver the State of the Union speech in person. Wilson started that. Then under FDR, radio came into its own, and under Kennedy, television and uh, now the internet, and uh, I think it's a fundamental change. Anyway, in selecting someone who's skilled in digital communications and who comes from the Facebook, Twitter environment, Trump is really signaling a wonderful way to wage his campaign. People are always asking me, how can we adjust for the liberal media bias? And the answer is to transcend it. For example, if you believe that we are mired in the gun control debate, and that however you feel about gun control, it's more important to keep our schools safe, and that the odds of keeping them safe by denying guns to some obsessed guy who spends his whole life trying to get them so he can go out and kill people is fairly limited. But the odds of being able to contain him by school security is very effective. Look at every courthouse, every government building, and every airplane in the United States to see how that would work. So if you think that's true, transcend the media and share these broadcasts. We'll develop our own media channels and don't worry so much about whether the establishment media is going to cover us. And I think the suggestion of Brad Pascal uh, really marks a, a definite understanding of that on Trump's part. He pioneered it in the past. And the fact that his campaign will be waged over Facebook, uh, I think, is terribly important. Renee? Thank you. And Cassie Schlosser asks, can you join the NRA if you don't own a gun? Hmm. Sure, the secret to it is you send them a check. <laughs> <laughs> and we have a question from Mike Bland. School security short term, of course, but how do we handle this issue for the long term? That is the long term. What's the long term solution to airplane hijackings? Well, eliminate terrorism, defeat the terrorists. But the long-term solution is security. What's the long-term solution to assassinating the president? Secret service. In this case, the long-term solution, the short-term solution is the long-term solution. Now, we may want to move toward a better society, but the, short, but the real solution is school security. Now, if you're after steps beyond that to deal with the fundamental problem of crazy people walking around the country, the answer to that lies in chemotherapy for, uh, for mental disorders. Uh, we have drugs that can control this stuff, and people on those meds uh, are not going to commit this, these kinds of murders that I know about. And uh, it's based on a 
delusional perspective that is fostered by mental illness. Now, I could be wrong about that. I'm not a shrink. But if it's true, the issue is, do we lock these people up like we used to in mental hospitals because they're danger to themselves and, or others? I think that's a drastic step for civil liberties. What I'd be more interested in is some scientific method where people can be given these medicines in effect involuntarily, uh, an implant or something of that sort that releases the medication and gives it to people and that that could be part of criminal sentencing as opposed to incarceration. I'm just thinking out loud here, but that's where I'd look. But let's not neglect the immediate point. School security is the short and the long-term answer. Janice Van Orden Krager says, Good Morning America had an interview with a teacher who said the shooter in Florida was down the hall in full guard and they are not releasing footage of inside the school, hinting that the kid arrested for the crime was a patsy and his confession and timeline is impossible. Your thoughts? Oh, I don't know. What else we got? <laughs> Yeah, I don't mean to demean the question. I just don't have any info to offer you. Okay. And uh, Celine Cuomo asks, Mueller dropped charges against Gates. Did Gates flip? What do you think? He didn't drop charges. He proceeded with the fuller indictment. But Gates pled, which means probably that Gates has flipped. Now, flipped on Manafort. I don't know what that means for Trump. Uh, Mueller, Mueller's whole theory... Mueller's whole theory is that Donald Trump met with Russia to collude on fixing the election and that if anyone knew about it, Paul Manafort had to be the one who knew about it because he was close to Putin. He was in the inner circle at the Kremlin because he had been running campaigns in Eastern Europe for Kremlin stooges uh, and that uh, that's where he needed to look. And that's a reasonable theory. So he's been piling up evidence to squeeze... Manafort, and the latest squeezing is through Gates, who knows everything about Manafort's operation, I believe. And uh, we'll see if Manafort cracks. Uh, and we'll see if there's anything for him to crack about. I personally don't think there is, and, um, and I, I don't think this investigation is going anywhere, but we'll see. Now, consumer confidence is at a 20-year high, 20 years. That brings us before Obama, it brings us before Bush, and it brings us into the middle of the Clinton era. It's highest since, well, 20 years. That would be 1998. Uh, the consumer index rose to 13.8, the highest since November 2000, and uh, the confidence con conditions measurement uh, went up to its highest level since 2001. Um, Economics is psychology, and these measurements are far more important than measurements of the money supply or velocity or any of that stuff, because fundamentally, the economics is a function of your attitude. Um, the Great Depression in the last analysis was caused by the fact that people didn't think it was going to get any better, and that they were scared to death that it would continue to get worse. So nobody parted with a dime, either to buy something or to invest to produce something. And now that you have confidence at these levels, this is creating an economic fact of life that I think is very, very significant. Now, um, the problem is that I think this is taking away the Republican Party's agenda. I don't think they have an act two down there. I think that their goal was largely shaped by opposition to what Obama has done. And they've done a wonderful job of dealing with that. The Heritage Foundation just released a study saying that they have implemented two-thirds of the recommendations of the conservative community, meaning Heritage and other groups. Um, Reagan, at this point in its term, had implemented only about half of them. But fundamentally, the Republican Party didn't shape its base around new ideas. They were ideas to repeal the mayhem Obama had committed by getting rid of Obamacare, at least the mandate part of it, uh, by getting rid of the high premiums by some of the mechanisms that are coming into place now for subsidy and for weaning out people from coverage. Uh, and, uh, and also, obviously, the economy, the growth 
of taxes, the hamstringing of the economy by regulations, the need to foster a business environment by lower corporate tax rate. These were largely reactive measures to take against the policies of the Obama presidency, and we've largely accomplished repealing those. There are others that will have to follow, and the, many of the regulatory changes are blocked by courts, but those will, come, those will be separated out, and we can deal with those. So the question is, what is the new agenda for the party? Uh, and, uh, and that's going to be a real problem, because basically when you lose control of the agenda, you lose control over events. The main power of the presidency is the ability to dominate the agenda, the ability to tell people what is happening and to structure that agenda. Henry Kissinger said it best. The duty of a statesman is to bridge the gap between his experience, between his nation's experience and his own vision. If the vision gets too far ahead of the experience, he loses control over events. But if he hews too, I'm sorry, if the vision gets too far ahead of the experience, he loses his mandate, people will turn on him. But if he hews too close to the conventional and doesn't propose new ideas to lead the country, he will lose control over events. The way I often explain this to clients is it's like riding a bike. Um, if the bike's going at 10 or 15 miles an hour, you're pretty stable. Nobody's going to be able to topple you. Dog can jump up on you and it won't knock you over. Uh, but if you're traveling at two miles an hour and you're just trying to get on, uh, then the slightest thing can knock you over. And the key thing here is keep your forward momentum and use it to keep control over events. And I'm worried that the Republican Party is not doing that. Now, Obama, in his o MIT speech, gave a great statement. He said, we didn't have a scandal that embarrassed us. I know that seems like a low bar. <laughs> it sure does, and a porous one. The reason you didn't have a scandal that embarrassed you was not that you didn't have a scandal, but that the media was singing your praises and echoing your party line, so there was no way of embarrassing you. But I personally regard the cover-up of Benghazi as a big scandal. I regard the IRS targeting conservative groups as a huge scandal. I resolve take, regard taking bribes to sell our uranium capacity to foreign countries, our biggest enemy, Russia. I think that's a pretty big scandal. Uh, so it's not as low a bar, Mr. Obama, it's just that you didn't pass it. <laughs> Renee? We have a question from Michael Morvan. Would Mr. Morris comment on how our HIPAA laws would be affected by more severe background checks? Well, the HIPAA laws are largely fictions right now. Uh, HIPAA, Health Insurance Privacy Act was adopted in 1993, uh, or thereabouts, as the concomitant measure for Hillary's health care reforms that never passed. But it prohibits the sharing of medical records, and it's absolute baloney. Uh, your medical records are shared all over the place. Uh, the Department of Health and Human Services demanded, demands that they be reported to them so that they can do data analysis. The state health departments get all of your data, and your data is a, might as well be available for sale at a newsstand. So I do not think that health data uh, is that significant to privacy right that it would overshadow the need to stop guns from being sold to somebody. Now, if employers wanted access to your health record to see if you should get a job, or if uh, real estate condos wanted it to see if they should let you into their building or their club, those kinds of things can't be permitted. But these kinds of laws are always balancing tests between the benefits of knowing and the demise. Keeping guns out of the hands of the wrong people is by far an overshadowing criterion. Gary Flotron asks, what was Obama's role in the Uranium One scandal? Why did he go along with the arrangements? And thank you for your wonderful program and all that you do. Thank you. Well, first thing was Obama did nothing. Uh, he knew, or had to know, that there were 10 Russian spies trying to get into our uranium network. He had to know that Hillary, that Bill had gotten a half a million dollar payment to give a speech before Hillary cast her vote in favor of the sale. He had to know that the, uh, that the 
spies were not heavily sentenced. Uh, they were basically let go with slaps on the wrist. So he had to, and he also knew that the FBI had an informant implanted there, and he should at least have been briefed, and I'm assuming he did, on the information that they were trying to bribe Hillary to get their way into that, and he did nothing, and he could have, could have done a great deal. This happened on his watch, and ultimately you have to hold him responsible for it. Now, we have a question from Patrick Rose. Will Trey Gowdy replace Mueller or be given a position in an investigative committee? Well, a position he wouldn't have because he's been chairman. I hope that he does. I hope that he uh, makes it into the cabinet and into the White House. He's such a skillful, important guy uh, that I hope they do that, but it's hard to tell. Now, the Department of Justice has just announced, and this may be a new issue for the Republicans, that it is going to sue opioid manufacturers and distributors and join lawsuits which have already been launched against them on behalf of the parents of children who've died from opium overdose, opioid overdoses. And uh, this parallels the tobacco litigation that went on in the Clinton administration to hold the manufacturers and the distributors liable for the harm that they do, or at least the cost of treating those folks. And uh, this lawsuit, which might then be joined by attorney generals throughout the United States, could really shake up this industry and rattle its cage. My worry here is that genuine production and distribution of painkillers that are vital to many people's lives uh, might also be impeded by this, and I'm concerned about it. It's a slippery slope, but clearly if you want to get a handle on this, this is how to do it. Um, I go back to my own experience. I had a biopsy on my tongue uh, before I was uh, diagnosed as cancer, and I had a, um, I'm fine now if you haven't caught on, and uh, I was given 30 Percocet after the surgery. Uh, I took one after the biopsy, the minor surgery, I took one, and there were 29 sitting there in the bottle, uh, which I could have sold on the street or done whatever with. And uh, we have to stop this kind of over-prescribing, and this would be a very good way to do that. Yep. Michelle Pokipala, can government and law enforcement agencies be sued for their negligence concerning the Florida school shooter? Uh, no. Uh, first of all, you can't really, on something like that, you can't really sue the government. It's caveat, it's, um, I forget the Latin name for it. Uh, but the, uh, I don't think you can. Uh, can you sue private firms, like maybe the security guard company that hired that cop that didn't go into the, sh into the building? Maybe you can. Uh, but that's not the solution. The solution, as we've said, is to harden the school sites. By the way, Cruz, the shooter, was in mental health therapy receiving all the counseling you want for a year after he turned 18, and he abandoned it when he became 19, which he was able to do, and, um, and you see how ineffective it was. Now, Steve Bannon may be gone from the White House, but his legacy ling lingers on, and uh, Steve's movement to change the Republican Party by running primaries against rhino senators and electing strong Republicans in their place, is, is moving forward. Um, in Tennessee, uh, where um, uh, there's a very strong candidate who's running uh, to replace uh, Corker. Uh, Corker had Marsha Blackburn, a congresswoman. And Corker had talked about getting back into the race and now he's announced that he won't. Undoubtedly, he polled it and saw that he couldn't win that. And in Mississippi, where we have Roger Wicker, who is the Republican senator nobody ever hears from, from Mississippi, who's been all but silent in discussing or speaking out about any of these issues, uh, and is not a reliable conservative vote, is getting a primary fight from Christy McDaniels, uh, the guy who almost beat Cochran, the guy who did beat Thad Cochran in the last election, but it was stolen from him and in the recount. And uh, he ought to be the senator now, but he's going to attempt to uh, go after Wicker and get that seat in the primary. And then you have Tarkanian in Nevada, 
You have people in Arizona and other places who are trying to replace rhino Republicans with movement conservatives. And that's a development really to pay attention to. Yep, Renee. Well, first of all, Wendell Latrell wants to let you know he's watching your shows from the Philippines, and it's Good. hard to find current news there except the fake stuff. So keep it up. He's lost without you. Good. Thank you. Uh, now, we have content restrictions on our television sets. Uh, you know, the ratings that you get advised of before a program goes on and uh, other measures. Uh, but the Disney company, Walt Disney, the pure people who, at, who work for children, have consistently opposed uh, these kinds of content filters. Um, the uh, Americans for Limited Government issued a statement yesterday saying parents should be allowed to filter the content that flows into their kids' minds if they believe it too violent or otherwise. Disney had led, has led the charge against content filtering for years, and now after this anti-competitive behavior, it is attempting to gain Justice Department approval for its mega-merger with Fox. The Attorney General and Justice Department should take into account whether Disney has abided with the spirit and intent of the Family Movie Act in opposing content filtering technologies and then act accordingly. I know I was shocked when I worked at, for Clinton in the White House that we had to fight for legislative approval for the V-chip, which would be inserted into TVs which permitted this kind of content screening. And Disney opposed us like crazy. And uh, at one point we threatened to call them out for it and holler at Mickey Mouse. And uh, Disney le relented. Uh, but they have always been against this, and you'd think they'd be leading the effort for it since they're always trying to be so child-friendly. But in this situation, they're not, and you should know that they're not. Renee? We have a question from Charlie Adams. He said, when you, he goes, Mr. Morris, when you went to high school, was there a shooting team? I learned gun safety in school. Shouldn't we really return schools to places of learning instead of places of confinement for those who should be expelled? Well, I think you need to expel some kids, and... Once they're expelled, you need to keep them out like crews. Um, I didn't have a shooting class. Uh, I had one at camp that I went to, but we worked out with and with twenty two caliber rifles, uh, the breech loaders, and didn't didn't accomplish much. Um, I don't think I don't think that's the answer. I think the answer here is school security, and that's what we need to get our focus on to. Now the U.S. has been trying to persuade the European Union to revisit the issue of sanctions on Iran and to toughen the sanctions and to aim them against ballistic missile development and the exporting of terror around the world. Uh, it's clear that Iran is now the subsidy, the bank that subsidizes the chaos that's going on in Somalia, in Yemen, and in a host of other countries. Uh, they are the financial center for terrorism and they're using the money that Obama gave them as foreign aid by unfreezing their assets and giving them access to uh, the global financial system. And we have been trying to persuade the European Union to go along with reimposing sanctions and upping the ante from nuclear weapons to also include delivery systems and subsidizing of terror. The European Union is saying, no, they're not gonna do it, this is bad faith. We need to keep faith with the Iranians. If we're nice to them, they'll change. And Trump is, is not buying any of that. Now, the United States can do these sanctions unilaterally and stop anybody from doing anything. If the United States announces that any company that, or government that does business with Iran will not have access to the global financial system or the United States will drop out of the system, uh, it'll rapidly get whatever we want. Uh, our power is just enormous over that. And uh, we should not hesitate to use it. And Trump usually doesn't hesitate to use his power. And I hope that in this case, this lays the basis for unilateral action that I think can accomplish everything that we want. Um, Dick, can you just explain to people again about your plan for the next week or so? Because yeah. people are thinking that you're not having the deep six anymore. So No, I will. 
Uh, I'm not going to have these 40-minute programs like we're having now, where you can post comments and get replies. I'm going to break them up into one or more five-minute broadcasts over the course of the day when stuff occurs or when stuff important takes place. They'll still be called Deep Six, the Deep State. They'll still be posted on my Deep State page. But instead of being at a regularly scheduled hour-long time like this is, they'll occur throughout the day. And um, you either have to set up your Facebook so that you get notified when I post something, and Renee will explain how again in a minute, uh, or just keep checking the Deep Six page until you see that I'm on. If you miss me live, don't worry about it because it remains on for 24 hours or really for infinity. Uh, so you can always look at it, but, uh, but it'll mean that you, it, there won't be something specific at four o'clock. Renee, please explain again how they can receive these notifications. Okay, you're gonna wanna go to Dick's, um, he has two Facebook pages, Deep Six to Deep State, which is his show page, and also Dick Morris Com. You're gonna click that you wanna follow, and then you wanna make sure that you see first. I'm sorry, they can go his... to they can go to okay. either of those pages, right? Well, yes, because I share it on both pages, right. Okay. Um, so make sure that your notifications are all turned on and that you see first um, Dick Morris, and you should get notifications. But if not, you can go to both pages Every time Dick does a video, I will pin it to the top of the page so you can go there throughout the day and see the newest uh, videos. When they have, they turn their notifications on. Well, they have to go physically go to your page. They have to click following, and then they have to, um, I don't know, I can post step-by-step -step guide, actually, if they need it, but most people know how to do it. Yeah, okay. All right. Yeah. Well, good. I hope you do. <laughs> Now, uh, there's a little interesting two-step going on between the courts and Congress over DACA, the Dreamer Relief. Uh, the, uh, Congress, the Congress has failed to extend the DACA period. So on March 6th, tr uh, Trump has the power to end the program and to start deporting people. The courts have issued a stay on that, and uh, the stay will probably carry until the early part of 19. And the Supreme Court, at the same time, rejected an expedited appeal so that it will probably not hear the case until the beginning of 19. So everybody's more or less agreed to punt this issue down for another year and see what happens. In the meantime, the Dreamers get what they want, they're not being deported, and the Republicans get what they want, which is they're not becoming citizens and they're not becoming voters and will be revisited in a year, and probably what they'll do is punt it again. And that probably is the permanent solution, that they're not going to be thrown out, they're going to be able to work, but they will not be able to become citizens and vote if they came here illegally. Well, thank you. Uh, I'll see you tomorrow, and again... No, the what? shares of the day. Oh, yes, okay. Uh, yes, let me do that. And that's I especially that. important now that we need to rely on that to get our... Um, to get people to know how to view. Yes. Okay, I would like to, sh to thank Daniel Manley for sharing these videos, William Calloway, uh, B.C. Benbella uh, for sharing these videos, uh, Patty Carlson, Garrett Young, Jim Wallace, uh, Randy Klein, Chris McDonald, Brian Ruddy, and Richard Baldwin. Thank you all very much for sharing this stuff. And please keep sharing my stuff so that people will know to log on and will know to get the benefit of this. Thanks a lot. Hi, this is Dick Morris. Welcome to Deep Six, the Deep State. Um, is the volume okay, Renee? Uh, I'm only hearing you on FaceTime, so. Oh, okay. Wait a minute, I think I have volume off. Yeah. I can hear you. I just checked it. We're good. Okay, is the volume all right now? Yeah, it was fine before. You were good. You're good. Good. Okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Deep Six, the Deep State. This is Dick Morris. Um, we're going to be doing something different in the future. Um, for at least the next week or two, I have a pretty heavy schedule of foreign travel. Um, and some races that I'm doing, and also around the U.S. to 
work for Republicans running for 